lovely introduction. I should take uh, some snippet of this now. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I just look at uh, look at connecting India, the the logo that you guys have, and uh, it's impressive. You've got two infinites on it. Uh, one is on Kotak itself, and the second is on on connecting India. Uh, nothing can be can be uh, truer than this. Uh, you know, infinite is really about what India will be all about. If anything is going to grow uh, and grow perpetually, I think uh, that's pretty much uh, where India will be. So Indian consumers, and which is what I, I would really look at, is something which you would really want to believe that uh, really magnifies that thought. So, uh, okay. okay, so what I've tried to do uh, in the presentation is uh, pretty much go along with some of the thoughts that I've uh, had for a number of years. Uh, and thoughts which have been developed uh, by by looking at various attributes of of behavior patterns of of Indian consumers or by myself in some form, and uh, I thought I'll just synopsize that as we make this. Uh, and it's all about consumption, consumer behavior patterns, and how we've seen that changing over over decades and years. Uh, so. Like everything else, I think uh, the most uh, interesting thing about India is about, about movies and how we adapt from movies and stuff like that and what do we learn from it. Uh, I thought there are certain things which are, which are fairly interesting and might be good to... Itna mat soch. Soch gari ho jai. To faisle kamzor ho jate hain. The reference point uh, is about what India Inc. is all about. And this is true for global also. Uh, when we say soch gheri ho jai, to faisli kamzor ho jate hai. Uh, you know, few things that I've, I've seen uh, over the last 25 years, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen uh, beyond that, is that uh, if you look at global history, uh, leaders of today are very, very rarely leaders of tomorrow. So 95% of yesterday's leaders die or become irrelevant over decades. Uh, you look at Fortune 500, 95% uh, of them have died or become irrelevant over decadal cycles. So 1980s list, and look at the same list today, no more relevant. The latest being G, which is pretty much extinct or just on the verge of becoming one. Uh, and leaders die for a particular purpose. And it's ironic that leaders die because leaders are fundamentally the best endowed companies in the world. Uh, these are companies and businesses which have lived the course they have possibly the best of management pedigree, capability, scale, profits, product attributes, distribution, execution, everything is just about perfect, and that's why they're in leaders. That's why they are part of Fortune 500 and so on. And yet the fact is that they die. And the irony is that no one, believe me, no one dies because of competition. Uh, and this is true today, it's been true for the last five decades. Uh, no company in the world dies because they can't compete as effectively with someone else. Uh, for instance, uh, and I'm just taking a shot, but Kotak will not die because, uh, because India Infoline does a better job or Merrill does a better job. Uh, I think that's part of the business that they need to face, and that's, I think, inherent to every business. Uh, Kotak will die if they fail to see a trend change, if they fail to see where businesses need to head tomorrow in the next 10 years, or where the consumer is heading, or where the clients are heading, and they don't head, and they fail to see the trend change and they'll die. I think this is really true, that leaders almost always fail to see a trend change. So the transformation that one always looks at, and transformation is a reality in every decadal cycle that one will look at, invariably, leaders don't lead the transformation. So it's always inherent on challengers to lead the transformation, and uh, Umang talked about it brief briefly, uh, and actually, we've, we've uh, captured that in some form. You know, our Times did not do daily hunt, uh, nor did HT do it, uh, nor did any other, other guys do it. So, you know, and print is something which is, you know, which is going to die 20 years back. It's known 20 years back that print will die. It's dying globally. So, you know, in India also it will die at some stage. But the fact is that existing incumbents cannot challenge status quo, uh, cannot challenge their own leadership, to lead disruption uh, for being relevant tomorrow. And that's why you require guys like Umang and, and other guys to come in and, and become relevant over a period of time. Uh, you know, just look at uh, this. Uh, 
you know, these are all segments of the trade which are present in our country, uh, and we have leaders in each of these segments. Uh, but the fact is that if we look at these categories and uh, look at the fact that who are the leaders who are leading the transformation, not a single leader of today is leading the transformation of tomorrow. So if one look at traditional banking, uh, uh, Vijay did it in Paytm, and I'm, I'm slightly biased towards Vijay because I used to do something, uh, I used to own a bit of stake in Paytm, but Vijay led transformation in, in, in payments uh, uh, in Paytm, and uh, in consumer businesses, uh, you know, uh, and this I can say it with some conviction, not a single brand has been built by an existing consumer company in the last 20 years. Not a single brand. So for the last 10, 20 years that one can think of, if there are any new brands which have been built in our country, it's built by challenger companies. Uh, and that's quite shocking because uh, you know, Indian consumer aspirations have changed and changed drastically, and yet existing leaders have done nothing to capture that transformation. Uh, true for everything that, that one speaks of or looks at. Uh, you know, Kishorji uh, in, in Pantaloon or, or Future Group, uh, pretty much, and I, I've known him for now 20 years, uh, uh, you know, for all the, all the, all the work that he's done uh, and obviously being the first mover and taking the risk appetite and so on, the, and he's possibly, and he doesn't have a baggage of the past, so he's not really, uh, you know, not second gen guy who's trying to do it right. But the fact is that he also failed uh, relatively uh, to transform the company and the business to what was the next wave of consumer behavior pattern. And it took, took other players to come and take that lead. So someone like Kishorji almost missed the retail growth in our country, despite being the largest retailer in our country. Yeah? Uh, through in print, and uh, we had put in daily hunt before Umang came in, so uh, it's pretty much uh, what we think that. I think a lot of businesses which are relevant for tomorrow are being built by by leaders or businesses which are getting born today. So a lot of inspiration. So. Ria, कहीं पहुँचने के लिए कहीं से निकलना बहुत जरूरी होता है. सही वक्त पे कट लेना चाहिए. नहीं तो गिले शिकवे होने लगते हैं. सही वक्त पे कट लेना चाहिए. Yeah. Uh, you know. One thing which doesn't change in any one of us as human is our DNA, right? What we think, what we are, uh, that's, that's pretty much the core of what, what everyone is, uh, doesn't change. But I think that's precisely what is required to change as businesses. So I will talk about consumer businesses, but I think consumer businesses is about transformation, it's about disruption, and it's also about entrepreneurship in some form. So uh, I'm just interlooping those three aspects and I think it's really so much core that if we require to, you know, earlier successful business life cycles were of 25 years. So fundamentally, you had an opportunity to learn, relearn, undo, relearn again. So possibly one had three lives before we died. Entrepreneurs had three lives before they died earlier. Today, there is a 15 year successful business life cycle. So, you know, even a Google or a Facebook or or whichever else comes in, I don't think uh, that uh, for all the rope that one believes they have, uh, they'll, have a, they'll have a business model which will go beyond that 15, 20 years. I think they will also struggle because someone else will upstage them and do it better. Uh, so effectively, you need to change the culture, the DNA of your own self and the organization to be relevant for tomorrow. And this, I think, is by far the most critical success factor that one would envisage would happen over a future time period. Uh, and it's very critical because you need to disrupt your own core today. Uh, need, to, need to let go of your successful baggage and let go of, or actually go through the winner's curse, as I would call it. You know, winners have their own curse. You become large, you become extremely relevant, and uh, by default, you don't change. Uh, the moment you don't change, you fall off uh, over decades. So I think it really requires you to change that. Uh, and this is the change which is happening across the board, across categories, across segments. Uh, so, you know, if one believes that yeah. India is about innovation and disruption, and this is true everywhere in the world, uh, businesses are built only on these two platforms, innovation and disruption. Uh, personally, I'm not a great fan of innovation. Uh, 
in India. I don't think India has the environment for innovation to happen in a materially large manner. Uh, and innovation uh, normally is significantly tech-led, uh, so we don't really have that conducive environment for doing it. But I think disruption is brilliant, because disruption always happens in a space which is large enough today. So the space already exists. So it's about addressing uh, uh, existing consumer, uh, more consumers, and new consumers, which is what disruption does. Innovation addresses only one part, which is new consumers. So uh, I've always had a bias towards disruption. And disruption is when you start to challenge leaders in their own way. Uh, and this is where leadership roles are getting challenged. So if earlier, the biggest moat in consumer-oriented businesses uh, was about distribution. So anyone who controlled distribution pipe was pretty much, uh, you know, so whatever went into the pipe is what the consumers saw and consumers bought. So let's say if an ITC or a Levers uh, controls 5 million outlets, uh, even if you threw junk in that distribution, it will still sell. And which is true. A uh, lot of it is junk, but it still sells, obviously. Uh, because the distribution is what you see as a consumer and thereby you buy. Uh, so distribution was the biggest moat for consumer businesses in our country for the last 50 years. And that's precisely the reason why you've never ever seen competition in consumer businesses. So for whatever noise, let's say a Sanjeev and Unilever makes, or a Sanjeev and ITC makes, that India is a competitive consumer market, uh, believe me, and I've spent 25 years doing this, uh, I think there's zero competition in consumer business in India. There's no competition in consumers. And that's the reason why existing guys continue to make 50% gross margin, they continue to make 70% return on capital, return on investment, perpetually. Even a company or business like Nirma, which should die, frankly, uh, and I'm saying this with all conviction, uh, you know, Nirma is a company which has been trying to kill its own brand. The promoters have been trying to kill their own brand for the last 15 years. And the company still grows. Yeah? Uh, nowhere in the world a laggard in any business grows. They should die, by default. If you are a capitalist society, Lagarde should die. If you are an inefficient brokerage house, if Kotak was inefficient, they should die. If Six Sense was a mediocre fund manager, we should die. Uh, Nirma grows. So an inefficient business still grows in India because in, it's, it's a consumer business and because of the fact that there is no competition in consumer businesses in, in our country. And competition does not exist because distribution pipe was always controlled. Yeah? Because you could not replicate distribution. So if if Levers had a 5 million distribution outlet, uh, there is no way that a challenger would come in and try to take shelf space from Levers because Levers would knock you off the shelf because they control 20% of shelf space. Uh, if you try to get into oral care, you know, it's so strange. Uh, Colgate Dental controls 50% of consumer, consumer market in oral care. And the product is average at best. Yeah? So for a very average product, and I could do a Colgate Total or a Colgate Dental as good as Colgate does it. Yeah? Or you could do it and so on. And yet the fact is that 50% of the market is capitalized by one person, one player. Not because the product is superior, not because the product has any IP of its own. There is no IP in Colgate or in Unilever product or anyone. There's no Intel inside, right? Uh, but yet the fact is that they control the market. So there's always a mortal fear of a challenger trying to come on and take on leaders in their space because they can't attack the distribution power of these guys, uh, which I think is changing. So when I talk about disruption, I think that's a big disruptive element which is starting to come in. We are starting to see baby steps right now. I think it is only going to gravitate and become extremely relevant over a period of time. Uh, Umang talked about it briefly when he talked about Daily Hunt and the number of uh, subs that he reaches out and so on. Uh, I think that's precisely what's happening, that because of regional, third party, e-com, and so on, now there is a life for, for challenger brands, challenger players to come in, evolve, and play their own game. Also, interestingly, because the life cycle of businesses have shrunk, entrepreneurs also have a great shot of becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, because earlier, if you tried to become one, you possibly spend almost half your life trying to become an entrepreneur and try to succeed at it, because you had three lives before you died. Now, if you die, you die young. And thereby, there's an ability to actually move off, do what you want to do, and then come back to entrepreneurship over a period of time. So there is actually a lot more entrepreneurship which, which comes in because everyone wants to take a shot at trying to become successful 
If they don't, they still have a core to go back to. So uh, pretty, much, pretty much where India is at this juncture, which is indulgence. So uh, you know, you start with the income effect, which is you want to spend. And the, the end is really about, about starting to say that, OK, I, I know I want to spend. And I know which, which part of the businesses I want to spend. And then start to go with saying that I want to spend beyond my means, which has really become more aspirational. Uh, because globalization has really made the world pretty much flat. And uh, that's what's happening. And India is really in the mid-stage of this journey. And uh, you know, again, like, uh, like it was talked about, that if our, if our per capita income levels today are one-fifth of uh, comparable nations right now, uh, it only has a bigger ability and better ability uh, to move towards the later part of, of what this uh, uh, So, you know, I, I've spent 25, and I'm sorry to relate to what we are doing, but uh, uh, it's more symbolic, so I, I just thought it's better to explain that out. Uh, I've spent 25 years in public market. So I've been a public market guy all throughout my life. Uh, yet when I set up my own entrepreneurial journey, uh, which is Six Sense Ventures, uh, it was a private market, uh, private market business. So, Hopefully, uh, there's a fair bit of conviction in doing venture stage or private market uh, stage that one's looking at. And that is precisely what I think will happen, which is that leaders of today will not be leaders of tomorrow, because like Fortune 500 says, that 95% of them die. So leaders of today are symbolic of listed companies and uh, because they've evolved. And somewhere they will become irrelevant over a period of time, over decades, so they will die. Uh, and any business, anything that all of us do, we want to buy into tomorrow's leaders, uh, if you want to buy tomorrow's leaders, uh, they're getting born today, and if they're getting born today, they're private. So that pretty much was the notion of setting up a venture fund or a private fund. Uh, and I think the, the skill set required for doing it is extremely different to what we've seen historic. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys might not have seen this, but uh, you know, this is something which has stayed in my memory. Uh, you know, this was about this is a boardroom drama of gangsters, right? And uh, this guy says that you know you can make make a lot of money by selling drugs. And while that guy, the main guy is a gangster, Prem Nath is a gangster, but he says that we will never do drugs. You know, something which harms the society will not do. We are okay with doing robbery, killings, and whatever stuff, right? Uh, drugs, no. And we'll not do drugs, uh, despite the fact that it makes 10x the money or 20x the money. And his son-in-law uh, gets excited about the fact that it can make 10, 20x money. Yeah? And he pretty much childs him saying that uh, you should never show your emotion uh, even if you are excited about it, keep it. And believe me, this has stayed with me. I've seen this movie maybe 30 years back, or maybe before that, uh, 35 years back. Uh, it stays with me. Uh, this, is, this is so true in everything that one does about, about venture investing, about, um, about you know, the fact that anything that we do, we need to stay the course and believe in it internally. I think the idea is not to really get excited about things that we see. Uh, and we, we, all, we all are guilty of, of doing this at some stage in our life, that uh, we get completely excited about markets also in a similar fashion. Uh, we, we really have a euphoric tendency, or we have a completely, you know, uh, on the reverse side. Uh, but I think it's important to just hold ourselves, uh, calm ourselves internally, uh, not that we should disregard the opportunity which is there, but I think it's important to, to, to see what it really means for all of us in investing, and I'm sure all of us are investors in some form. So I think that to me is a very critical way of our behavior pattern and uh, how we really relate to opportunities. Uh, we can jump onto something, uh, better to just sensitize ourselves a bit before we do that. And I think in some form, uh, listed market doesn't really give us that chance to do it. Uh, and I'm not trying to negate listed, but I just think venture does it a lot more. It just 
helps us to have that, uh, that terav in some form. Uh, just pause a bit uh, before we start to, start to take that bigger, bigger leap. Uh, so what we do in Sixth Sense is pretty much, uh, pretty much about uh, you know, investing early, uh, investing ideally in first-gen entrepreneurs. So you know, I've always believed that uh, almost always, so never say never, but uh, you, know, you will very rarely find uh, we getting excited to invest in second-gen entrepreneurs. So, uh, for example, uh, I can say names. So, uh, uh, will I get excited about investing in Rishabh Mariwala, for instance, uh, who runs Mariko, uh, Harsh Mariwala's son? A bit unlikely. Not because Rishabh is not a capable guy. I think he's fantastic. But uh, do I find in him the ability uh, or the fire which possibly Harsh had when he started Mariko? I think that would be a big difference. And I'm, I'm just referring Rishabh as an anecdotal fact, but I think this is true across almost everything that we'll watch and we'll see. Uh, and this, I think, even if we visually look at anyone who's succeeded with some decorum in the last five, 10 years in our country is almost always first-gen entrepreneur who's really done it right, who's got no baggage of the past. There is a huge risk appetite uh, which, which enables them to really do uh, and, uh, and, and scale up businesses uh, in a manner which none of us have done before, none of us have seen before. So, uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm used to dramatizing it a bit, so uh, just putting this up, uh, Titan will die. Uh, and it's to make a point. Uh, I think India is at that stage where, and it's quite a convergent stage, that I think Indian brand loyalty is at an all-time low. Indian brand awareness is at an all-time high. Yeah? So I think the affinity to buy into brands is possibly at the highest level that you've ever seen in our lifetime. And I think that will only continue further and further which means that obviously smaller, fringe, unbranded, regional players will almost die over a period of time. Having said that, brand loyalty is at an all-time low. So I think, the, I think just for given that if, if I look at my own daughter and she's a 13-year-old, uh, will she ever wear a Titan in her life? Uh, I don't think she'll ever wear it. Uh, not because her father can afford something better. It's just because if she's seen her father wear it, she'll not win to wear it. And this is true across all brands that one can think of. So anything which has been a legacy brand, and maybe powerful, but a legacy brand, uh, you'll possibly just see 90% of those brands collapse or become irrelevant in the domain that they are. So Titan will need to suddenly start to possibly sell, sell saris and ethnic wear and something else and no longer be Titan watches. And, and this one will be true only in retrospect, maybe five years, 10 years out. Uh, because the way I see Titan, it's not about a, a guy who sells watches, a guy who sells jewelry. It's about a guy who understands 500 square feet retailing. That is what Titan is all about. It is not about watches, it's not about jewelry. They understand 500 square feet retailing, and if that 500 square feet retailing means that you need to start to sell, sell uh, I don't know, luxury products, sell, uh, sell shoes, sell something else, they'll do that. So I don't think Titan, what we see today, is the Titan that will remain in the next five, 10 years. So uh, more about it is about brands that we think are super, super powerful today. Uh, Apple, for instance, as a brand, uh, super powerful. Uh, will it be as relevant? Uh, I have my doubts. Uh, and I'm, I'm fairly convinced about my doubts in this. So uh, I just think to just buy, and I, I, I say this to Ramdev also at some point, uh, uh, you know, he has this philosophy of, uh, sit tight and buy right, no, buy right, sit tight, something, yeah? Which is about uh, investing for 25 years and so on. I think uh, the journey of the 25 years, and it's symbolic, I understand that, but the fact is that I'm, I feel the ability to make huge super brands, which was the course, which was the order of the day 10, 20, 30 years back, I think no longer exists in our country, no longer exists anywhere in the world. Uh, I think it's the, age of disruption, disruption of brands, disruption of the way consumer behavior is, consumer aspirations are, consumer needs are, and thereby the needs getting fulfilled in different manners and so on. So brands will get competition from platforms 
and platforms will become brands and so on. So I think there will be a complete different way of the way businesses will operate over a period of time. Uh, okay, I'll skip what we're doing. Uh, obviously, we just, just a word on this. Uh, so we are India's first consumer-centric domestic venture fund. Uh, we do venture investing. Uh, we've partnered in the last uh, four years of six cents when we've set it up, and the last 10 years when I've been investing significantly in private markets personally. Uh, we've been fortunate to participate with almost every leading brand which has happened in our country in the last 10 years, so quite fortunate for that, and uh, the journey's been, been extremely powerful, but this is not about six cents. So. I want to fly, I want to fly, I want to fly, I want to fly, I don't want to fly. Okay, so again, I think the attribute is, and these are all, frankly, just things which stay with you, that what you would want to do as businesses and so on, that you want to keep innovating, keep scaling yourself, keep differentiating, because as investors, and I, I would just, I can't advise uh, you, but I can just suggest that, uh, you know, believe me, that whatever you guys are investing in, whatever I'm investing in today, so whatever we invest in, because we see the business model today, we look at the numbers, we look at whatever's around us, and so on, when you exit out of it, these are two completely different businesses. So what you invest in is what you believe in, what the business is going to be all about, what you sell down in, which is three years, five years out, is completely different business. So try, if possible, to focus on what your exit will be, which is about what that business will be, more importantly, over the next three, five year curve, because business will change. Environment will change. All, you, all that all of us need to do is invest in an entrepreneur. Maybe it's easier for us to slightly do it because we are private and we have enough time and effort to do it. But uh, invest in entrepreneurs who you think are at least six months ahead of the curve. That's it. Period. You need to like the face of the guy you're investing behind. Uh, and when I say the face, it means the face and the credibility of the guy. And second is about, about the belief that you have. And the belief is only proven right in retrospect. But the belief that you should have that they are six months ahead of the curve. 95% of the companies died because they could not see trend change. All that we need to do to be successful is to believe that we can see the trend change. Trend change ourselves or in the sponsors that we are investing in. And I think we would have done our job. Yeah? Uh, OK, let's skip this. So this is the last one. Back line, stay tight. Forward, you've got to push up, push up. Push up, push up, push up, push up. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Just run the ball and go on the goal post. Run! Okay. Uh, I think this to me is the biggest inspiration that any one of us can have. This is about a guy who has no clue how rugby is played, how a sport is played, how a business is done. He has no clue. All he is being told is that there is a goalpost and you need to just touch the finishing line, period. You figure it out what it takes to go there, but you have to reach there. There are variables around, so there is competition, there is opposition which is around. Uh, they'll try to stop you, they'll try to hurdle you, and so on. Uh, you don't need to play the sport the way sport is played every moment. You don't need to follow the rules. Uh, and I, believe me, uh, we, try, we follow the rules, but we don't follow the rules. So we try to do it our own way every time. And, and I think it's so much critical in our life because there is no set rule book. Set rule books are made when there is a set way of running a business. There is no set way of running a business anymore. So life has changed, businesses have changed, variables have changed. We have no clue what the next variable will be. So we will all sound very intelligent right now out here. Uh, because we are supposed to know what those variables are. Uh, Umang is supposed to know, and Nilesh is supposed to know, and I've heard him very briefly right now. Uh, but believe me, none of us have any clue. We have a fair degree of guesstimate about what that will be. 
or maybe we possibly think that we know that there are enough variables, if nothing else. Uh, what we need to do is that we should know what our goalpost is and figure out what is our best way of reaching that goalpost. It need not be the way someone else has done it in his life. It need not be the way, and I'm not yet successful as much, but if I've done or someone else has done, I think that's completely irrelevant. I think you figure out what is the best way that you think uh, expresses yourself, and uh, I think that will really be what all success will be all about. So, yeah, just that was the last message that I had. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your time.